Hi, I'm Carolyn Heyman from Peace Direct. Hello, Quinn. <laughs> um, I've got a, a question, a couple of questions, really. Um, I'm really interested in what um, you said, Chip Walker, about this evaluation. Um, I was talking to someone at the Swedish Foreign Ministry about something very similar. But I think it's important to factor in not just whether it was localized, but where the leadership came from. In other words, was it localized, but people were implementing a donor's idea, in which case the sustainability will look like one thing? Or was it localized in the sense that it was really locally led, that it maybe supported something that was there before the project started and will continue? So I'd just sort of be interested if that dimension could be factored in, and I'd be extremely interested to follow what you're doing. Um, the second question is really about another blockage. We've talked a lot about risk as a blockage to localizing aid. The blockage that we're most aware of, um, we support local peace building um, in conflict areas, is, is the issue of scale. Um, this is the thing that always comes up. Yes, we'd love to support local peace building organizations, but they're very small and you know we've only we can only think in terms of several million pounds. And so you end up with such a constricted apex that um, the local the local um, impetus and leadership is never able to come through. So I'd be interested in people's views about scale as a as another blockage. Great. Over in the corner. Thanks. Ed Hedger from ODI. I'm gonna Try and sneak in four questions, but um, <laughs> stop me if you only want two, and I'll and I'll come back. They're they're all quite short. Uh, the first, which maybe to start with, um, Jonathan and perhaps Alistair might want to pick up something I know you grappled with when you were looking at the research was the whole question of this being motivated as much out of a, the, the approach to localizing aid being motivated as much as a sense of principle as evidence. We operate in a world where recognition of the importance of the demand side is is in the um, ascendancy, given choice, given multiple forms of aid. And the reality is that many of the traditional recipients of ODA are asserting themselves more strongly, and a high on their list is something that is forms of assistance, particularly through the state that use country systems. How much do you think that principal factor plays out, and in what ways, and what's that piece of the story? would be interested to hear a little bit more. Um, the second question, um, which is both for, maybe for, for all the panelists, is, one version of the findings is this is an essential part of your toolkit if you want to be effective in the way you provide your aid. You need to have the possibility to, um, to localise it. Another sort of more nuanced version of that is that at country level for any given set of objectives, it's important that there is at least some localised aid. That doesn't say anything about particularly which donors are providing it, as long as somewhere in that assistance there is some that is localised. So you could argue from that one organisation could localise all of it through budget support, the other could provide it in a purely projectized portfolio. Uh, if you look at it in that way, each according to their own possibilities in the context of a balanced portfolio, are you in danger of letting some people off the hook, actually, that this creates the possibility to avoid this because each instrument has its place and each approach has its possibilities and there's a recognition that not all donors are equal in terms of their domestic political economy possibilities. And I just want to use a bit of a double-edged sword. I'll rattle through the last, the last two. Um, the third chip, just I would be really interested to hear the US perspective on some of the domestic contractor response. We, in the UK, are becoming more accustomed to dialogue and narratives around our sort of development select committee in par parliament, akin to some of the, the congressional oversight committees, where there is an increasing reaction from some private sector contractors to aid that is multilateralized in a way that gives government greater responsibility for signing off work programs, for signing the checks. And the argument is, um, is the, the fiduciary concerns come very strongly to the fore. And I sense that's just coming more strongly and less vocally. In the US, I think there's a much, much stronger, a more organized lobby around contractor response. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how that's playing out. So say you're not just how you're managing the politicians in this, but how you're managing the, the, the contractors. And if there is time, um, Alistair, uh, one example that's often talked about, and I think I'm sure is the basis for much of your paper on 
the, um, the risk profile, is the case of Afghanistan, where this actually happened, and I realised that your own role in there was, was, uh, was potentially significant. But what was it that allowed you to just get on and do that, other than the fact that you just, get, just got on and did it? I mean, was that as simple as that story, and you were prepared to take the risk at an individual level, or did you have particular license, or did you build a constituency of interest? In that most apparently challenging of circumstances, how do you do it despite the odds? What I refer to there is the Afghanistan Reconstruction Trust Fund, where a very substantial amount was invested initially, and then it was scaled up. And that perhaps suggests some, some policy implications might derive from that one example. Um, feel free to edit what you want people to respond to on that. I thought I'd put some things out. Thank you. At least six questions there. I think, um, Jonathan, if you, could, if you could make a start and perhaps, I think, particularly talk a bit more about not just the whether to invest in domestic, uh, in local actors, but the how, which I think a number of Caroline's questions were speaking to, as well as some of the principle, sort of principles versus evidence questions that Ed put to you. That would be great. Yeah, I mean, one of the questions that... I think I think you put was on scale, and whether whether scale is a big factor, and I think that you know if you have a chance to read the the kind of one of the section on special civil society in uh, the second paper, there's a lot of discussion of that, and basically big donors are not really ever going to be providing aid to small directly to small um, to small organisations. It's the same transaction cost pretty much providing a million dollars or providing a thousand dollars. So what they do is use Apex contractors. Now what we're saying is it's not it's not whether donors go directly to the small, it's how it's 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 which Apex contractors they use. And there's an instinct behind the kind of push to localize aid that using local Apex contractors, which will tend to be big local organizations, uh, national organizations, is more likely to ensure that other local organisations, be they smaller, uh, receive money and support, and we're challenging that. I mean, it's not, um, it might be the case, it might not be the case. And it's not just about technical ability and capacity, it's very much often about politics. Uh, and it may well be that international organisations, in some contexts, are better placed to support some smaller organisations than large national organizations. Um, again, because of the scope of our research, because we were looking at all sorts of countries uh, and all sorts of contexts, we were just unable to, to give that kind of, you know, general, general support to, to the localizing of aid. Uh, there's a bunch of other factors to do with, uh, and, this, and this is the other part of your question about ha how to go about it, uh, to do with how overheads are managed, uh, how contracts are drawn up. In the private sector section, there's a wealth of ideas about how to support private firms and specific procurement policies, um, uh, whether firms need to qualify first, and a whole bunch of kind of detailed stuff that, 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 that's, that's in there. Um, and that links a little bit to kind of a theme that's emerged about principle. In fact, um, uh, Alex from Stars made this point uh, earlier, which is. Um, you know, when we first put together the, the kind of uh, um, framework for this research, there were three main reasons we could think of for the kind of aid effectiveness, uh, the push towards aid effectiveness in particular use of country systems, uh, which was to do with cost effectiveness, re reducing transaction costs, um, improving results, delivering on objectives, and also uh, long-term sustainability, strengthening systems. Uh, when we actually got to kind of, especially talking with people, the main reason, or one of the main reasons certainly that people would give for localising aid or for using current systems was the principle. Uh, it wasn't an instrumental, it wasn't an instrumentalist argument, it was a principled argument. Um, now, I don't, is that, and Ed asked, and how important is the principled argument? I suppose it's how, how, however, however much importance you give it. I mean, in a lot of contexts, um, it's just not going to wash, is it? You know, you go to the big donors and say it's a principle, they're going to say, well, you know, it's our money. Um, thanks for your view. We need to see that it's spent well. It's in a sense, fair enough, but it's not necessarily um, something you might agree with. I, I mean, and, 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 and that, that links a lot also to this interesting relationship between that I've, that I've struggled with over this year of research between, between advocacy and research. So I'm aware that producing a report that says, you know, 
other other ways of lo other ways of, of 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 giving aid might be equally successful as localizing aid. It's not exactly going to help, you know, those organisations that are desperately pushing donors to localize more aid. Uh, and all, all everyone's going to you know take what they want from it and use it and bandy it around to back up their their own particular prejudices and instincts. Um, uh, and ultimately, I, I would argue that politics is the main barrier here. I mean, you know, development practitioners generally know more about what they're talking about, would want to introduce complexity, would want to introduce long-term systemic considerations. Um, I can only assume that it's the politicians and the oversight, well-meaning as it is, uh, that, that prevents actually unironically sensible decisions. I wouldn't be surprised if Alistair, in answer to Ed's question, you say that it was some sense that kind of a different kind of oversight that you were receiving that allowed you to take risks in that context. Um, so, you know, I, I, I was in a situation of one, of one hand wanting to kind of, you know, advocate for something that I generally believe in, which is that more aid should be localised, at the same time in the position of a researcher actually looking at the evidence, and this, and this links in with, with Chip's kind of, I suppose, realisation reading our rather long report that, um, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not, there's not a lot of evidence out there. There's a lot of evidence out there. There's, there's been plenty, well, on the, on the state uh, pillar, we did three pillars, right? State, private sector, and civil society. On the state, there's tons of evaluations, and a lot of them are very positive about budget support and other forms of localised aid. We just felt that there were reasons why it was still not good enough evidence to generalise, to do with causality, um, to do with country context, and, and, um, and, and, and the fact that there's evidence that other modalities work as well. So ultimately, we came out with these kind of uh, um, not wholly 100% um, backing localized aid. And uh, I know that wasn't quite the question that people were asking, but I think it's an interesting reflection because, like, because, like, you know, you try and be honest to the research at the same time as recognizing that some people are going to take that and, and do things that are not necessarily um, ideal. Uh, were there any other questions I was meant to answer? Perhaps you could just touch on this idea of should this be part of the toolkit for all donors? Oh yeah, so that's actually. I mean, I, 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 that's a very good point, Ed. I mean, actually, it is a point that we that we raise in the in one of the reports. I don't remember which, but it's it, absolutely. Uh, if you if you've got a, a country where you've got say you know just theoretically ten donors, five of which are localizing a lot of aid, it may well be the case that the other five don't need to localize aid. And you put it as kind of you know letting them off the hook. That's very much the kind of language of advocacy and and kind of Paris and all that, you know, we're not going to let you off the hook. But in development reality, who cares if they're let off the hook? But it's not about letting people, in my view, it's not about letting people off the hook. It's about donors working together complementarily. You know, and I, I would kind of emphasize complementarity over harmonization. Harmonization is this big kind of thing out of Paris. But, you know, sh sure. And, and again, I'm letting USAID off the hook here. Right, because USA, or you know, they're always the ones that aren't doing budget support. But I mean, they could be doing some really good work that isn't budget support. But you know, I recognise that that's not going to go down particularly well. But yeah, that, that, I basically, yeah, I think I think it's about um, donors working out what they're best at, working out what their particular barriers to progress are. In other words, just shouting more loudly at, at donors that are, are failing to use country systems might not make them use country systems. You know, they are actually have they actually have bu bureaucratic and and political barriers, it may well be that they should get on and, and do other things. And um, finally, you know, like I think I said earlier, aid modalities, you know, there's been a lot of work done on aid modalities. My, my instinct, again, having, uh, you know, done this research, is that probably too much emphasis is made about aid modalities, you know, whether or not um, country systems are used. I, I think it's, you know, it's perfectly possible to use country systems, to put money through systems, and put money on treasury, uh, you know, you look at World Bank operations in the 80s. Uh, this was, you know, uh, localized aid. Uh, absolutely diverting, and then when we talk about localizing control, it was the opposite of that. Um, so, in fact, the, absolute, ac the exact aid modality may or may not be the most important thing. It's actually the attitude and the, the political analysis uh, that may be more important. Thank you. Alice, there's a specific question on Afghanistan, but perhaps yeah. you might want to comment on one or two yeah. others as well. Uh -huh. How did we do it in Afghanistan? I mean, I, th I think it, it was interesting because th these uh, trade-offs were very apparent. I mean, because of the September 11, 2001 uh, ad attacks, the, the, cons the, link, the national security objectives, political objectives, all of these things were, were very important. And, and therefore, um, 
you know, we, ha we had a lot more freedom to act than, say, my counterpart in, in, in some small um, remote country that um, wh wh where, the, where the challenges were purely, were pu purely poverty related. In terms of managing the cons constituencies, first, um, I had the support. I was the, at that time the director to the vice president, so I could actually have quite more influence in the, in the, in the region, South Asia region, than, than a country director normally would. I also had really good links with the president of the World Bank, with Jim Wolfenson at the time, who was personally committed to this, and, um, and, and, I, and, and also at the board. I mean, we were briefing the board every, every, every quarter, and, and then when I was in Afghanistan, I usually met with visiting um, ministers uh, from, the, from the G7 countries, not just development ministers, sometimes defense ministers, as well, some interesting stories there, but but um, but 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 that was but, but it, this enabled to, it, us to, to sort of create um, a constituency to be able to explain one on one that this was a high risk situation. We we thought um, you know th things would happen. In fact, um, we thought more more risk outcomes would happen than actually did. We had special um, checks and put in place. We had a very good fi finance minister as a counterpart. Our aid had to be localized. But um, the first thing we financed were some agents for the for the government process, procurement, um, accounting, accounting reporting, audits, and, and and so on. And then that eventually shifted to the government as they built up their own capacity. In the case of the trust fund, we were financing government salaries and operating and maintenance costs, lots of tiny expenditures, and we employed an international firm of accountants that would go and do ex post verification of expenditures. And if they didn't pass, I think there were three sets of hurdles, then we would refuse to finance that and the government would have to use its own very scarce fungible resources, which <coughs> it was reluctant to do. So it had an incentive, uh, incentive to do it. And then on the trust fund donors, we're always meeting with them um, at least quarterly, um, sometimes more often, and, and having sort of frank um, exchanges just exactly um, what risks we were we were facing and what we were doing about it, and then when we did have a risk event, we put it right at the top of the agenda for the finance minister's meeting with the managing director and the relevant vice president of the World Bank. It was only a small amount of money, but we just wanted to demonstrate that we took um, risk outcomes involving money we were responsible with very very seriously, and as he. <laughs> He first was in slight sort of denial, but then he, um, he he rapidly took action because he knew the credibility of the government was at stake, and all the money that, that was being non-localized that that proportion would increase if the government lost its reputation for managing money effectively. I'd also like to go to the point of scale because on particularly on peace building, because I have seen these local peace building efforts being very very effective and. Um, I, I think, at one hand, the scale is you really want to be able to, you know, influence peace, you know, at the national level, and that may require program design. It may require associations among people working in this in this field, um, if, if they're too small. But there are also small donors who who are happy with small um, programs. I mean, go to New Zealand, for example, <laughs> um, which has a very small. Um, a, a program which 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 might be interested in this um, in this kind of kind of thing, um, and then I should stop there. I think. Thank you. Um, Chip, would you like to come in on this specific question on contractors? Yeah. Well, I wanted to say um, a couple of things. First of all, I mean, I think the the suggestion about how to structure these ex post evaluations. I mean, I think the point that you made is uh, is a good one. I I mean, we haven't advanced very far in terms of how we want to structure it. Uh, other than a, a commitment that we want to do several of these. And I think to some extent the number of dependent variables will depend on how many of them we're able to do. But I think the point that you make as well is, uh, is a good one. I, I mean, I'm, I am sort of intrigued about, I mean, this question about scale um, actually does go back to some extent about uh, the conversation that we've had in the U.S. with our uh, implementing partners around uh, sometimes there's sort of negative initial reactions to the uh, in to the uh, implementation and procurement reforms. Um, the 
because I think it's important to separate two sets of arguments here. I mean, and and it's uh, it's it, it basically breaks down into a set of arguments that were advanced by our uh, traditional international NGO partners, and then those that were advanced by the by the contractors, and they're somewhat different. Um, the first ones with respect to the international NGOs, and I think a lot of this was, and just in general, was basically motivated by I think a kind of an unfortunate sort of interpretation that the reforms that we were doing as they were initially focused very much on mechanisms were largely being driven not by our desire about sustainability but by one of the other reasons there which was about value for money and that the reasons that we were doing this were not about how to support sustainability but were sort of saying that that the, that the options that we had most available to us were too expensive and I I'm, and um, you know I think that that was not the way we intended it to be interpreted but we didn't anticipate that reaction. The, but I think that the, this question about, I think that one of the things that has been enormously, that has changed as we have begun to work on this policy and the outreach that we have done to these various communities has been on the point that um, there is no one right way to engage with local systems. And in fact, that you need multiple kinds of approaches. Um, and that there really is an important role for APEX organizations and for technical assistance in it. You know, what the particular mix of it is in any particular context needs to be locally determined. But uh, there is a particular role of it. And part of it goes to this question around scale. Because although I think the presumption is that donors like USAID are not in a position to provide lots of little grants to organizations and therefore you do need uh, apex organizations who are capable of doing that. As a matter of fact, we are now in the process of, in many countries, giving out very small amounts of, of, of aid, less than $100,000, to quite a number of different organizations in advance of our, of our uh, objective here on localized aid. Um, to me, it's a, it's, a, it's a question about whether or not that is the best use of USAID's staff time and so forth. Um, there's no question that our staff in the field enjoy the opportunity to engage more directly with uh, recipients and so forth and getting outside of the office and, and so on. But uh, how to balance the workloads that's associated with that kind of retail work with the other kinds of responsibilities they have is something that they have raised to us uh, about moving forward. So I think there is a role for these and, and actually there have been a number of very more supportive uh, reports of in the last couple of months, uh, Oxfam US and then more recently uh, Mercy Corps have done stur surveys about this work and both of them have come up with uh, essentially, in, um, I wouldn't, I would hesitate to use the word endorsement, but certainly um, a sort of feeling that, that moving along the lines that we are doing is actually improving our relationships with uh, recipients in the developing, in the developing world and um, although they have a number of helpful suggestions about how we could do it better, um, I think a feeling that USAID Forward and the work that we're doing and promising on local systems and local solutions is in fact uh, uh, movement in the right direction. I think the other interesting thing about it is, is that the contractors on the other hand have been really taken on this risk issue um, as a big part of their argument. And the reason that they say is, is that if the US government as a whole is essentially going to maintain relative risk aversion as far as local, you know, as far as its development programs are concerned. That's the reason we need these contractors because they are willing to absorb that risk. Um, because if things don't go well, uh, we do have the ability to, uh, we have a number of remedies that we can in terms of recovering funds or um, other sorts of remedies that we have to get that funding back. And so they sort of see themselves as essentially guarantors of um, a more, uh, you know, of sort of maintaining that kind of risk neutrality. Uh, at least some of them have, have put that argument forward. Um, and I, I mean, I, and I think that there's some truth to what they're describing, but as I said, I think that ultimately what we want to get to is really a more nuanced conversation around risk. And, I, and again, I think that uh, as we have been talking, uh, recognizing that you know, there, are, there is a role for all of these actors. Um, and including, I mean, one of the things that's not prohibited by, by, by localized aid or anything else is and there's no reason why a local entity can't contract with an international organization to provide it with services, uh, even if those services are essentially initially funded by, uh, funded by us. Um, the last thing I just wanted to, to um, 
to say was is that I think that one of the thing, one of the hopes that we have, and this goes back to this question, one of the questions you were asking, Ed, um, that we hope about this local systems approach is that one of the things that we really feel is that is that this is an opportunity in terms of sort of making clear. Um, I mean that one of the first steps needs to be mapping out uh, who the players are and what their roles are and what the nature of the relationships are and so forth, the rules under which they operate and where the, where the strengths and the weaknesses are of a particular local system that is producing a set of results. That by, by making that essentially a sort of a public process, I think it gives all actors, both local and international, an opportunity to figure out how they may fit into support strengthening. And so you're right that I think that it's possible. I mean, I think that in that case, you're absolutely right that, that I think somewhere there needs to be some localized aid in that process. Um, but I don't think that the necess necessary result is going to be that somebody is going to do one thing and somebody is going to do another. I mean, I think that what it is more likely to be is that, I, what I hope is, is that this creates a platform for, a, as you were saying, a more sort of coordinated kind of an approach to sort of understanding both weaknesses and, and how different um, uh, friends of that particular system can engage more effectively and provide their resources um, in a way that don't, you know, that, that's a little bit more coordinated. Great. Um, we have a question from our online audience um, from Reva Neem, who's a development consultant working with health um, international NGOs and based in Houston. USA and she's interested to hear views on how international NGOs should be looking to raise funds in a post MDG era while also localizing aid or also in the context of more localizing aid and I think implicitly there are questions about whether there's attention for NGOs international NGOs in particular in terms of some of your messages and I might just abuse my position as chair to ask a couple of questions myself um, and one Jonathan and I, I know you quite well so I hope I can get away with this but I think Maybe we could, you could be, be pushed a little bit further about how challenging your findings are and, and how much you really are challenging some of the orthodoxy of aid effectiveness. I mean, it seems to me there, there could be an argument that you're sort of repackaging that actually a lot of the themes around building local ownership, investing in country systems are being sort of repackaged in a way that perhaps l looks better for others but, but doesn't necessarily get to the core of some of the, the challenges of perhaps why aid doesn't always seem to work effectively. So what, what for you is new about this and what is really challenging and, and, and should lead to change practice? Um, and Chip, I was very intrigued by the points you made about adaptability and accountability as, as core parts of, that need to be brought into a, a sort of localising aid approach. From my own work, looking at the sort of the politics of service delivery, absolutely we've seen that it's having, those f it's having feedback loops that can actually ensure that institutions you know, deliver effectively and, respons and responsively um, to different populations. And I wondered if you could just say a little bit more about how you're building that in, whether it's something you intend to have as a core component of localised aid going forward and, and, how, and how you picture that. Um, perhaps we'll start with Alastair and then come to Chip and give Jonathan the final word and, um, and you can wrap up perhaps with any final reflections um, as well as addressing those comments. Let me take, try and answer the question of how should international NGOs raise funds in, an, in a localized aid, aid world. I mean, I mean, one of the things we've seen in some countries is, um, is, serve, is, is public provision of services such as health, public financing, if you like, and delivery by, by non-state um, non actors. And you, you could have a, um, a model where um, the aid uh, for the health sector, say, flows through the government to the government, which is what happened in the health sector in Afghanistan, which then contracted out to international um, and local um, in NGOs. And I think uh, there's an interesting example in the Whole of Society report, the fourth report in, in the series of, uh, of Liberia um, health service delivery. And I think one of the things which international NGOs could have done but were not required to do was to help develop a local NGOs as part of the permanent service delivery 
um, capacity of the of the country. So I could see a role for um, international uh, NGOs, but it may be slightly different from the role they've played in the past, which is essentially applying humanitarian models to to service to permanent service delivery. Um, I'm glad Alistair mentioned the Liberia example because I, mean, I do think that that is also in the health sector because I think that we sort of see this as um, a very good example of, of how USAID's approach to, to, to localize aid can, can work effectively because it is exactly as he said. Um, um, and I think that the, the, the innovation, if you will, was sort of moving and basically moving from a system in which USAID was directly funding a group of international NGOs to one in which the government requested and we said uh, and we agreed that they felt that they needed to be playing the role of essentially the contract manager and over uh, steward of the of the health system and so our funding is now going directly to the to the government and they are the ones who are supervising uh, those international NGOs on the question of uh, of accountability um, there are a couple of you know a couple of uh, of sort of, I mean, in addition to the research that ODI did, there are a couple of sort of reports that have been rather influential, and one of, uh, in a, in at least in sort of the thinking that's gone into this, and one of them actually, which has, at least in my mind, considerable legs, was the 2004 World Development Report on service, you know, improving service delivery for the poor, which. I think made the very powerful argument that effective service delivery is not just simply a technical problem, it is, it is equally an accountability problem. And so that, in other words, that you get better results when you have a, when you have a level of local accountability. And they sketch this out and they provide a variety of different sort of uh, paths of accountability and so forth. And I think that to some extent, I mean, that we have sort of embraced that kind of general, general approach. I think that what we have what we have sort of recognized is that the kind of uh, they they limit themselves to sort of three basic kinds of actors, and I think that what we're as we've gone into it and sort of talking about uh, real uh, local systems, that obviously is more complicated than that, and that uh, and that there but but that but what is still true is that there needs to be multiple directions of accountability. And some of it is in the more traditional political sense of making sure that there is um, political demand for uh, on governments for uh, good services and so forth, and that uh, politicians are held accountable uh, uh, when they make good decisions in terms of supporting health and, and social service delivery and all the rest of it. But a really critical part of it, and this is very much central to our emphasis, I is on uh, ensuring what has often called social accountability, uh, which is, or in that report, the client power, which is essentially the, the ability of local people who are the direct recipients of services to have some degree of oversight uh, and engagement with the service providers over what's going on. And uh, one of the ideas that, we put that we're putting forward in the strategy is, in fact, ensuring that every single project design, and what we're saying is, is that project designs ought to take a system as its focus, that every single project design needs to talk about how they are going to be strengthening accountability within the nature of that particular project. Um, it, they may say, we've looked at it and it is sufficient and therefore we're not going to do anything more, but you know, I think that that's one of the things that we're going to be, that we're going to be looking at. And as I, as I alluded to, I think that it is actually in that process of providing that level of feedback um, that not only provides the basis for ensuring that services are well delivered in the present time, but it is that kind of ongoing sort of, uh, that kind of information that really provides the basis for recognizing, cha you know, external changes that need to be adjusted to. <coughs> and that's, I think, where you begin to get that sense of how the connection is between accountability and adaptability, because mm -hmm. that's where the messages come from, that things are not working as well as they once did, and we need to make some kind of an adjustment. Mm. Thank you. And Jonathan. So, <clears throat> I mean, it's up to other people to decide whether or not what we're saying is kind of interesting, original, new. I suppose I, suppose I would split up our challenges. I mean, I, th I think there'll be a bunch of people annoyed by some of this stuff. Um, not least, and kind of, again, politically incorrectly, quite a lot of recipient countries. Because back, back in 2003, 
when, when the aid effective, the current aid effectiveness era started. And we ended up with using country systems as the kind of, you know, dominant, one of the dominant themes in, in aid effectiveness. What recipient countries were actually looking for way back then, still would look for now, is not using country systems, it's sending us the money to use on our budgets. Now, they didn't get it in negotiations because donors refused to promise that. So we ended up the kind of using country systems language. What this report is saying is, well, no, it's not, the evidence does not show that providing more money to the state uh, is more likely to strengthen the state. Um, I think that is counter-orthodoxy, uh, certainly within the uh, aid effectiveness discussions. Uh, it's not, I'm not saying it's challenging donors. It, well, what it does do is challenge the current uh, kind of, uh, that's, um, I, suppose, I suppose, Paris orthodoxy. And I suppose in our first paper, we, we set out a, a bunch of critiques of Paris. What the current aid orthodoxy, uh, aid effectiveness orthodoxy is, is probably Busan. And, and yeah, there's more similarities uh, with what we're saying, the focus on the private sector and civil society, not just on the state, something that we emphasize. Some, some kind of broadening out of of uh, an assessment not just of low-income countries, but also of middle-income countries. But I suppose um, the, 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 the messages we're sending are, you know, don't fixate so much on aid modalities. The focus on the political, not just the technical, is still an area that the aid effectiveness debate is really struggling to deal with, uh, probably because it's just not something that is easy to you know, for, for, for government, the government representatives come and meet up and discuss these things. It's not that easy to discuss these kind of complex political issues. But as people responsible for millions of, of taxpayers' dollars, it's not acceptable for donors not to recognise the politics of aid effectiveness. And, you know, you could get all the technical tick, uh, boxes ticked and still be totally wasting your money or spending it on something that doesn't work, you know. Um, so, you know, we, 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 we emphasise that. And we also emphasise, again, the human the human um, uh, decision-making elements as opposed to the target uh, mentality. Um, that's a challenge to the orthodoxy, and a challenge to donors is localise more aid, even in fragile states. I think that's a pretty challenging um, thing to say. Um, we say that it's not more risky uh, if you look at all kinds of risk that wasting money is as bad as losing money to corruption, even if it won't make the front page of the Daily Mail. Um, and, and we challenge the focus on results. Um, you know, a lot of people are doing that as well, quite rightly. But I hope that this paper helps, or this series of papers helps those that are just seeking to balance out a bit the politically motivated focus on short-term results with a more developmentally sensible balance of short-term results, long-term structural transformation. Great. Thank you, Jonathan. I think, um, I think you have convinced me. It seems to me <laughs> that there, there is something in a name and that this concept of localising aid is a useful one. It's, it's clear. It's obvious what you're talking about. But I think your four reports also go into some depth in terms of looking at, at how to invest in different types of local actors um, and how to embed that within this understanding of the, po the political environment, the incentives, you know, which I think very usefully um, takes us forward. Um, and I'd agree that, that the, the strong recognition that aid is risky, but that we need to balance some of those risks and, and measure them in the round more effectively is useful. And I think it's great to hear that there are some, in some very concrete ways, that USAID and I hope other agencies are starting to take on board some of this. Mm. So um, for all of you, thank you very much for your participation and your questions. The audio and the presentations from this event will be online in the next 48 hours. And I think it just leaves me to thank our panelists for their excellent contributions and for giving us such a, a wealth of, um, of experience and examples today. So thank you very much. Thank you very much.